how did you get involved with conventions overall? Start going to conventions. How, the first um, convention you went to. My very first convention was October of 2004. Um, that would have been the Boston Wrestling Convention. It was run by Boston Wrestling, Dan Marotti. It was at the Suffolk Downs uh, Dog Tracks. That's in Revere, I believe. Um, it was my only time there. And it was a very small scale convention. It was in one room, pretty small. But uh, as a fan, you know, it was just great. It was a great experience. You had Greg the Hammer there. You had uh, legendary Ox Baker. You had the Iron Sheik was there. Um, Duke the Dumpster, I'm sorry, uh, the Duke of Dorchester, Pete Doherty. Uh, he was there. Rich Palladino was there. He was kind of hosting a uh, Q&A session with a little bit of the panel. Um, there was a vendor there by the name of Big Andy Varga. He was from Clifton, New Jersey. It was the first time I met him, and we actually became good friends. Uh, he was a huge collector. I was a huge collector. So I started buying original promo photos off of him, and that's kind of how I first started getting into uh, collecting a lot of the rare pieces. He would get all of this inventory of rare promo photos. And uh, Big Andy would always send me a handwritten letter in the mail every month. Hey, Joe, uh, you know, I've got all this you know, stuff I've run into, here are the prices. And I'd buy everything up and uh, he'd refer to me as his number one customer, but we became good friends over the years. Um, unfortunately, he passed away. Eventually he was gonna be a vendor at one of my own fan fests, but he became ill. Um, so that didn't pan out exactly. But uh, at that very first convention for Boston wrestling, Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart was supposed to be there. He couldn't make it. Uh, so uh, there were a couple other people there. Ivan Putsky was there, Animal of the Legion of Doom, Dustin Rhodes, Gold Dust. Um, so definitely a, a pretty cool lineup, probably about 15 stars total. And they had a raffle where you could enter to win uh, ring worn gear. So last minute, my wife's like, you know, my wife was with me and she's like, you know what, just throw in a ticket. Let's do it. So we throw in a ticket last minute and they pull my name. Uh, there were three winners, I believe, and I won the ring worn singlet of Animal of the Legion of Doom. And it was signed by him and he handed it to me personally. And he's like, make sure you take good care of this, you know? And uh, that was a cool memory. You know, that was definitely what a way to kick off my convention, you know, scene by winning one of the grand prizes. Uh, the other grand prize that night was Macho Man's ring worn hat. It was like a neon green hat, said Macho Madness on the side. Um, so they definitely had some cool prizes, but um, that was a good memory. And I actually obtained an AWA eight by 10 collage from Big Andy that day, uh, purchased it at his vendor booth. And uh, it had three autographs already on it but it had five people pictured and it had the rock and roll express in the upper two corners. And then down below it had uh, Medusa. It had Kurt Henning and it had dead center uh, chief Wahoo McDaniel. Now this piece was already signed by Medusa chief Wahoo and Kurt Henning. So already an awesome piece. And I purchased it, got a great deal on it. I forgot what I paid, but it was next to nothing. Uh, Big Andy had, he was the one who actually ran that event that those people appeared at. So he got those nice collages made up. And I ended up adding over the years, probably about 20 to 25 autographs on it. Uh, everybody who's worked for AWA, you know, you had to be in the AWA at some point to sign that. And uh, now it's a piece that, you know, is, is one of the top pieces in my personal collection. Uh, certainly worth thousands of dollars now. It's got Hogan on it. It's got Piper. Uh, it's got um, Iron Sheik, General Adnan Al Casey's on there. Uh, you, I added both of the Rock and Roll Express on their pictures. And as I said, Kurt Henning signed it. Uh, Chief Wahoo McDaniel, Medusa. I added Jimmy Jam Garvin to it, Wendy Richter, Renee Goulet, uh, Boris Zukov, Larry Zabisco, Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, both of the high flyers, Greg Gagne, Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, Rick Martel's on there, Jerry the King Lawler, the very last AWA champion. 
Um, so it's it's certainly a who's who. Magnificent Don Morocco, Mr. Fuji, Minji Okalin. You know, they're all on there. And uh, Larry the Axe Henning as well. And Larry signed kind of close to his son's signature. And that's another great memory. He held it up and realized that his son signed that same, that very same piece. And he got very teary eyed. And he's like, wow, my, my son held this. I said, oh yeah, your, your son signed this. And he just kind of paused and stared at it. And, uh, it was, you know, very teary eyed. Like I said, he got very emotional and, uh, he was just so happy to sign it and add his signature to it, knowing that his son hold, held that very, you know, same piece. And, uh, it's actually rare to have a piece of any kind signed by both Larry the Axe Henning and his son on the same piece. You don't see that often. I'm not sure I've actually ever seen it, but I'm sure there's something else out there, you know, but it's definitely a, a rare, you know, occasion to have them both on there. So one of my prized possessions and obtained it at my very first convention. So I uh, really enjoyed that convention. And just a few months later, January of 2005, I went to my second convention, which was in Tampa. So I flew all the way to Tampa for this thing. It's only my second convention. And I'm like, you know what? Let me just do it. The lineup was unbelievable. Um, still to this day, nothing has topped that in my eyes. Uh, it was called Wrestle Reunion. It was the first annual. And... Uh, it was a three-day convention. I got there Thursday night, stayed at the Double Tree Hotel in Tampa. It was all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And then I went back home Monday. And uh, so not a cheap trip by any means. Just the hotel alone was, you know, pricey. I got it for like four nights or whatever, but well worth it. Uh, I got the super ticket package for $250. Um, but I mean, I met a lot of Florida territory guys being right there in Tampa. I got to meet Mike Graham. I got to meet uh, the Thunderfoots, number one and number two. I got to meet Gary, uh, meet Gary Royal, uh, Paul Jones, uh, number one. And uh, man, I mean, I got pictures with Rowdy Roddy Piper and Harley Race and uh, Johnny Swinger was there, Samu of the Head Shrinkers. Lex Luger, uh, Crush, Brian Adams, the only time I've ever gotten to meet him. And he was one of my favorites growing up as a kid. Um, who else was there? We had uh, the Ugandan giant Kamala. You had Bill Apter. You had the wild Samoans, Afa and Sika. You had Abdullah the Butcher. Um, there were Q&As, you know, throughout the weekend. I, I got to see Q&A with Jake the Snake and Diamond Dallas Page, and they talked about Oh, they were roommates. I got to see a Q&A with the Midnight Express, Stan Lane and beautiful Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, uh, James E. Cornette, along with the Rock and Roll Express, Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton. Um, Magum T.A. was there. The American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Dustin Rhodes, uh, Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster. Uh, had like an hour conversation to kick off the weekend in the hotel lobby with Scott Hudson, former WCW commentator. Um, so that was a cool way to just start it. You know, see all the guys arriving in the hotel. He's telling all these stories on the couch in the lobby. Such a nice guy. I uh, got to meet Dan Spivey and uh, Sir Pat Tanaka, Christopher Daniels, the Fallen Angel, um, Bruno San Martino, Kevin Nash, Joey Styles. Jimmy Valiant, the boogie woogie man. I mean, how could you top that weekend? You know, it was just uh, enormous. Living legend, Larry Zabisco. Um, remember Jimmy Valiant. Cell phones were still kind of, a lot of people didn't really have cell phones. And Jimmy Valiant needed to call his wife to let her know that he had arrived safely. So Jimmy had, uh, you know, I let him use my cell phone. So we went to the hotel room. He used my cell and he's, very gracious about it he's like anything you need me to sign you know it's on me so he signed a few magazines for me and stuff and um that was the first time we had met so you know first time we really had uh become friends we remained friends from there on and 
you know, Jimmy Valiant's one of the best friends I've had in wrestling. So it's just so generous, so down to earth, so genuine. And uh, just a few days prior to going to that convention, I won a phone call uh, as part of a raffle. You could win a phone call with a superstar. So I won a phone call with Jimmy Valiant. So I had a 20 minute conversation with Jimmy prior to that. So then I got to meet him in person, you know, the whole cell phone deal. And uh, Saturday night, right in the dead center of that weekend, there was a live wrestling legend show as part of that convention um, right there in the hotel lobby in the ball, not the lobby, the ballroom. And I had second, uh, second row ringside seats for that show. And man, <laughs> I would go to that show over any, you know, WWE show or WCW. I mean, that show was just stacked. I mean, the show opened up with like a, a six man tag with like Jimmy Snuka coming out of retirement and Roddy Piper coming out of retirement, Jimmy Valiant for his, uh, you know, his retirement match and uh, Colonel De Beers and like all these legends wrestling you know it was a 20-man battle royal with all the legends Bugsy McGraw Virgil Greg the Hammer um main event was like a six-man hardcore style match and it was Dusty Rhodes teaming up with Dustin Rhodes and CM Punk it was the three of them against like Kevin Sullivan Abdullah the Butcher and I don't know one other guy and man it was just you know chaos and uh they had the eight women's tag with uh some new and up and coming women but as team blondage uh amber o'neill and uh I forgot the other one's name they were in there sensational sherry came out of retirement she wrestled in there and uh peggy lee leather was in that match wendy richter came out of retirement so it was just so cool you know you had uh nwa tna was big at the time and they were represented on that card jeff jarrett defending the NWA TNA uh, heavyweight championship against Tully Blanchard with J.J. Dillon in his corner. And you also had the TNA tag team straps, uh, America's Most Wanted, AMW, defending those belts against Terry and Dory Funk. Um, so, yeah, it was it was crazy. You got new, you got old, and uh, it's supposed to be Christopher Daniels versus AJ Styles. AJ couldn't make it at last minute because it was a bad ice storm in Georgia. So he couldn't fly in. So it ended up being Christopher Daniels versus Pat Tanaka of the Orient Express at last minute. And maybe on paper, it's kind of a weird match, but man, they broke, they just tore the, ho the house down. Uh, Pat Tanaka, Chris Daniels had an awesome match. And uh, the convention was run by Rob L. Russin and Sal Corrente. Uh, Rob, unfortunately, passed away recently. Um, they filmed the entire weekend. And for whatever reason, something happened with the film. And I don't know if it was lost or if it was distorted. It was never released. So that whole wrestling show and everything that went along with it, Q&As, gone forever, unfortunately. But uh, the biggest part about that convention weekend at Wrestle Reunion was the grand prize raffle. So if you were a super ticket holder for $250, you were automatically entered into the raffle. Tons of fans came from all over the U.S. and beyond to go to this convention. So there were probably a couple thousand fans throughout the entire weekend. And they pulled a gentleman's name. Uh, we're all sitting down, you know, waiting to see who was going to win. And I forgot his name now. Real nice man. We actually stayed in contact for a while. They pulled his name and he was active military. Um, so he said that he couldn't accept the award because he was going to Iraq. Um, so he was not going to be able to, you know, take the, uh, the prize. So they pulled a second name and it was me. It was my, oh, not name. I'm sorry. Second number. It was my ticket number. I'm staring at it. Like, no way. That's not possible. And I didn't go up. I'm looking at it kind of in awe and they called it again and it was my number and I got up, went up and they're like, all right, you are the official winner of a trip to WrestleMania. And I was just like blown away because WrestleMania was going to be in Hollywood, Los Angeles Staples Center. Uh, it was WrestleMania 21. So I go up to the stage and he said, 
all right, we can give you two options. You could either have uh, really good seats, like really good seats for WrestleMania, or you can have really good seats for WrestleMania, not front row, and really good seats for Monday Night Raw and the Hall of Fame ceremony. And I said, well, let's do it all. So we got seats right off the floor for Monday Night Raw, two tickets. I got uh, two tickets to the WWE 2005 Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And that's the year that you had Jimmy Hart, you had Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, you had the Iron Sheik, you had Nikolai Volkov, you had Rowdy Roddy Piper, and you had Hulk Hogan being inducted. And Hulk Hogan was inducted by Sylvester Stallone. I mean, they really went all out. It was an awesome ceremony. And I get into that uh, orchestra pit where they were. I found out that my ticket uh, for the Hall of Fame ceremony were front row. So we're front row in the orchestra pit. pit. You know, you, the whole roster from WWE is sitting right there. Uh, it was just insane. What an experience. And, uh, you know, WrestleMania, we had awesome seats right in the dead center of the arena, but it was in a special section where a waitress would come down to your seat. You have a menu there. They bring the food right down to you, the drinks right down to you. Um, at that time, there were $200 seats in 2005. So now who knows how much they would be, you know, they'd be some crazy price, probably a thousand bucks or something, but, uh, it was an awesome experience to go to Los Angeles and uh, they put us up in a suite at the Beverly Hills Hilton in Beverly Hills, uh, California. So we're in a suite on looking Rodeo Drive, which is literally a corner away from our hotel. Um, it was just an insane experience. And uh, while we were there, my buddy Ryan, who took the other ticket for everything with me, uh, he lived in Arizona at the time, so we just ate one of the flights. I flew in. He drove to me from Arizona because it wasn't long for him, so we had a car. So we went everywhere. We went to Lakewood, California. We went to um, RVD's comic card shop that he had at the time in Lakewood, and uh, he had Bret Hart there as a guest, so we met RVD. We met Bret Hart. Uh, we went to Venice Beach, the boardwalk, and checked all that out of course beverly hills uh we went to the hollywood walk of fame in los angeles and you know the wax museum and i mean we really made it a full trip for four days we went everywhere and then obviously raw and the hall of fame and wrestlemania an experience i'll never forget you know and i was like a celebrity uh the week the rest of the weekend at wrestle reunion when i won that wrestlemania trip <laughs> walking through the hallways and everybody's like, oh, you're the guy who won the WrestleMania trip. And it was just a cool experience all the way around. Wow. That sounds insane. Like one after another things happening. Oh yeah. It was definitely a highlight for sure. That uh, Rob Russin was involved in wrestling a couple of times because he ran an IWA Back in the late 80s, early 90s, that was really good. I used to get on TV that I really enjoyed. Yes, he did. Actually, the Battle Royal at that show in the ballroom there at the convention uh, was actually for the IWA uh, championship. And I believe Greg the Hammer won the Battle Royal, so he won the championship. They were still still tying that in. No kidding. I'm going to be putting up some of the tapes. They had like Kerry Von Eric. Lethal Larry Cameron, all kinds of big, big names. Like, when oh, I come yeah. on, I was like, where did this come from? Right. Yeah, it's I a think... shame that the, the tapes were lost because, uh, you know, it, it was a who's who, the card, you know. Um, also had Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus Ugandan Giant Kamala on that show. Uh, Marty Jannetty wrestled. I know Lanny Poffo was in action. Um they had a mask versus mask match. I think it was the grappler versus uh, the mask superstar, Bill Eady. Um, so it was really cool for old school fans, you know, mostly old school wrestlers. But you, like I said, you had, you know, Christopher Daniels and some of the lady wrestlers um, that were a, a bit newer uh, kind of sprinkled in. So definitely a cool experience. Right. Back then they were. Young though, this is before Kerry went to the WWF, and I mean every match 
was like top guys that were you hadn't seen in a year or two, you know? Wow. Wow. Be interesting to kind of see how that all started and how that transpired. You know, it's too bad Rob passed away. It would have been cool to maybe see like a documentary on it or something. Right. I think he was also involved in that NWF with DC Drake and stuff. I think he had something to do with that too. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. And you mentioned Larry Hennon, uh, him and Holly Race, man. What a great team. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially Harley. I mean, one of the toughest, uh, intimidating looking at Larry and Harley side by side for sure, you know, but Harley Race, genuinely one of the, the toughest in, in wrestling history, I would say. Right. But a lot of people say you get a lot of that from Larry because you come up with Larry, Larry's side being a tag team partner breaking in and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Larry was a awesome man. And he was a, such a nice guy. He took the time with his fans, took the time to talk, tell stories, always had a smile on his face. Whenever I met him, he was, he was a really nice guy. So uh, while we're on that, what about New England Fan Fest? Do you have anything to talk about New England Fan Fest? Well, we kind of touched base on the New England Hall of Fame, which, uh, like I said, started at kind of take place of intermission at some of the local shows for APCW. I don't want to give back to uh, the local scene. And, you know, New England has such a rich history. Um, 2009 was the very first time that I kind of turned it into its own event. You were there for that one. Uh, Gino Martino was inducted that night. And um, Just Incredible was inducted. Ox Baker headlined it. He was inducted as well. Uh, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, was there. Um, he inducted Bobby Rydell. Um, it was a special night. Sheldon Goldberg was inducted. Jim Kettner, of course, the owner of the uh, ECWA. Um, so a lot of cool faces, a lot of people who really accomplished a lot, not just locally, but all over. And uh, so that was 2009. 2010, I did the Hall of Fame again, but I said, you know what? Let's turn it into its own kind of full weekend. And I said, let's tie in a fan fest with it. So 2010, it was two days, which that was the only time I used that format because it tends to work better. Um, either it's hard to explain either one full day, you know, where you're doing everything and maybe the Hall of Fame the night before or something like that. Um, the only time you want to expand it in a multiple days, if you're going all out and you're doing like a three day weekend, that makes more sense. You can pan it all out. Um, so, you know, we had Adam Baum uh, come in in the morning. He signed autographs on day one. We had Ox Baker, just incredible. Um, and then day two, we had Superfly Jimmy Snuka. We had Dangerous Danny Davis. We had Kenny Dykstra. Um, Larry Zabisco, the living legend. We had Antonio Thomas of the Heartthrobs. We had John Cena Sr. And we had Rick Martell. It was a very rare Rick Martell appearance. He hadn't been doing a lot at the time. Um, so I flew him in from Quebec. Um, great response for him. So it was a mini fan fest. It was very small, maybe one or two uh, merchandise vendors. And uh, Matt Bourne was also there. Uh, he was a vendor, and it's funny, Matt had just come from Mike Spada's WWA show the night prior, so he was already in town. So he had his vendor table at the Fan Fest, calls me over to the table, and it looks like he literally slept in his doink attire. His makeup is, like, kind of faded. His hair is just all nasty, but still got the green in it. <laughs> so it's like he literally you know did the wwa show went to bed woke up came right to the fan fest but he calls me over to the table he's like joe uh you want mick you want mick to come you think uh mick could have a table and i'm thinking to myself mick there's only one mick in wrestling as far as i know and i'm like well you can't be talking about mick foley i mean that's mick foley's a high price point guy you don't just get Mick Foley. Yeah, sure. You know, so I said, well, uh, yeah, you know, I was kind of preoccupied with kind of running this thing. So I'm like, uh, yeah, Mick can have a table. That's no problem. 
He's all right, I'll get him on the phone. Okay. So that was kind of the end of that. And I went back to uh, taking care of everything. Maybe an hour later, Mick Foley walks in with his Bruce Springsteen, uh, you know, jacket on there and flannel and everything. And I'm like blown away. Mick Foley's just checking out all the merchandise tables. He's buying a couple things, comes and introduces himself to me. And he's like, oh, thank you so much for, uh, you know, giving me a spot at this. Uh, you know, I was in the area and uh, Matt called me up and really appreciate it. And uh, Mick ended up signing, you know, unannounced for probably about an hour, maybe just over an hour. And he had a nonstop line. People were going crazy, panicking when they saw him. Like, what? I mean, people were literally that were local were running home. Or like speeding back to like Swansea or Seekonk and grabbing stuff at home and rushing back to get it signed. It was pretty fun to watch. Um, but that was unreal. Mick Foley. What a nice surprise for everybody. You know what I mean? So that was a cool experience. And uh, and the Fan Fest kind of grew each year. All right. On a little uh, downside note, can we get into uh, somebody you knew, knew called Spider? Yes. Um, yeah, his name was Daniel Quirk. He was from uh, Shelton, Connecticut. And uh, he was an independent wrestler. He wrestled all over New England um, for a few years there. I mean, he, had a, a, he was only 19. He was only 19, but he wrestled for a few years there. I remember ring announcing him for Powerhouse Wrestling. Uh, I was in like the Worcester area. He'd always do like the Massachusetts shows. Might have done one or two of Kid USA's events at the NAWF, if I remember correctly. Um, and then he hooked up with UCW for a while when they came back in uh, like 2004, 2005. And I was the ring announcer once again with them. Um, but I was there the night. Uh, he wrestled as Spider, and he was always known as, as Spider. Um, but Daniel Quirk was his real name. And unfortunately, I was there the night that he passed away. Um, I was the ring announcer for that show. And I was with Spider behind the curtain in gorilla position. Uh, right before the match, just kind of getting his information. And uh, I remember I was supposed to be running another HWF show at that venue. It was in a new venue for me. It was at the Taunton, Massachusetts American Legion. And it was coming up in like, a, I don't know, maybe like two months or something. And Spider was going to be on that HWF show. Um, I had booked him. So we were kind of talking about that gorilla position. He's like, oh, I'm really looking forward to your show. You know, and he promoted it on his website and uh, he was ready for it, you know. And we were just Chit-chatting back and forth, I took his information, you know, to announce him. Go out to the ring, I announced him, and uh, he was going against uh, the highlight kid. And unfortunately, there was a uh, – I, I sat back down at the commentary table, and it was Tiny the Terrible sitting next to me, if I remember correctly, um, and then Anthony Rufo, Ali Muhammad. Um, he was the owner of UCW and he's sitting there and Spider rolled to the outside or something and Highlight Kid came over the top rope and there wasn't a lot of room to play with out there. Um, it was very tight in between that commentary table. You know, this is at a very small American Legion and Highlight Kid, his knee basically caught Spider's forehead, I guess and kind of drilled it into the ground because Spider, it was too awkward of a spot for Spider to kind of catch him uh, properly and safely. It was just not a lot of room to play with. So drilled his knee uh, right into his head and just all the way down into the ground. And uh, there were no mats, you know. Um, back then, I mean, obviously injuries can happen on any show. But back then, you'd often see three quarters of the events didn't have mats. Um, should they have had mats? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, but back then it was just the norm to 
you know, not have the mats out there. Um, obviously, after something like that, you start to think, okay, we need to have proper precautions. And, you know, now you see mats regularly. But back then you didn't in the uh, 2000s, you know, around that time. Um, so that was tragic. I mean, being a part of that and just hearing the impact, you could hear the impact. And uh, I kind of looked under the table and I was like, man, that just didn't sound right. You know, I just knew. And it was a very small crowd. I mean, there was probably 30 people in the crowd. And it was one of the rare occasions that I wasn't filming the show. And I'm thankful that I didn't film the show, you know. But I was the ring announcer on there. And uh, I stood up from the commentary table. And it looked like a scene out of a movie. It was just, uh, it was crazy, you know. Or just, you know. So I, I uh, kind of stood over him. I was one of the first people to, you know, approach, see what the heck happened. And uh, I mean, he was just staring right at me, you know, just staring right into my eyes, but he had, you know, blood coming out of his eyes, his ears, and you knew it was a bad situation. And uh, Widowmaker came out maybe Dan Badandi, a couple other wrestlers, and, you know, everybody's kind of assessing the situation. Obviously, 911 was called immediately. Um, one of the fans might have even called immediately, but um, even with 911, it was, it was just, like, you know, such a bad injury. Um, so he it was such a hard night to get through, you know. Um, obviously, the night stopped immediately at that point but I'm saying you know just the night in general and uh the wrestling show was immediately stopped um I remember everybody just hugging and you know Widow and I just gave each other a big hug and uh, I always have that memory you know you just everybody was kind of consoling each other and uh I remember they put him on the ambulance and uh that was really the last, you know, last thing I want to talk about anyway. There, there was obviously more detail to it, but uh, it was a really bad experience and uh, ended up going back to the hospital with a couple of the other, with my wife and a couple of the other uh, wrestlers on the show. And we were kind of just, even though we knew it was bad, you know, we were there being hopeful that, you know, miraculously you would, you know, come out of it but unfortunately passed away that night and uh yeah that was that was crazy i remember going to the uh the funeral or the wake anyway i went to the wake and huge turnout in connecticut the funeral home i mean just massive turnout you, you see all the guys from all different promotions you know uh ucw powerhouse and all the Connecticut promotions that he was a part of, you know, everything, you know, Kowalski students. I mean, everybody was there. You even saw um, Velvet Sky, who I think at that point was already with TNA. Um, she started making a name for herself, but she's from Connecticut and obviously knew him. You know, she came to the, the wake and uh, it was a who's who, you know, they paid respects to him and, it was pretty tragic. He was only 19 years old and such a nice kid. So Spider will certainly always be remembered, you know? Yeah, you don't have to get into more detail, Joe. It was more of a remembrance I wanted to bring than uh, details. Yeah. Uh, I really didn't want to ask the question, but it was part of your career, so I figured we should have, you know, at least brought it up. Sure. <laughs> 